Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the lab. In this video, I'm going to be talking about building a full stack web app with Svelte Kit and F Sharp. So the way that I'm gonna do this is first introduce a project that I just built uh, with the stack, smash the button, um, and then talk about some workflows uh, that I thought about when actually creating this. It's once we have the context about like what is the actual project, what is it actually trying to do, then we can go into the system architecture to see how that supports this job. Also dive into some of the technologies that I use to actually create a working real world app with this stack. And then finally, I'll go into a few design decisions, um, a few things I thought were interesting, trying to build this stack for scale. So first let's talk about the project, smash the button and what it actually is. So basically it's just a button with a number on top. And when you click the button, the number goes up. Simple as that. So why did I build this? Well, this obviously isn't very useful, um, but what I really wanted to do by building this is kind of learn the F Sharp language um, and also learn uh, functional programming paradigms. I've largely been like an OO person for a long time because that's what like most code is actually written. Um, but I was like, what is this functional side like? Uh, how can I come over from C Sharp pretty easily? And F Sharp was basically the answer to that. The inner goal here was to see if like functional was useful at all um, if I wanted to do it. And spoiler, yes, it is. Uh, probably most of my code recently has been and probably going forward will be um, more functional. Um, and the inspiration for this exact project was uh, just something I've been wanting to build for a while. Um, I don't know if you've seen the subreddit like the button or the cowboy app in high school. I thought those were funny, so I just kind of wanted to clone it. This also gives us some weird um, scalability uh, problems, um, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but that just makes us an even better project to see like the real world of these technologies. So now we know what the thing is. Um, I wanted to kind of take a step back and, and think about workflows. Uh, no software really should exist by itself. So workflows help us understand like what are we trying to solve? Um, what workflows do we need to actually solve it? And that actually helps us build the software that actually does the solving. So uh, basically for understanding what to, to solve, I like to use jobs to be done. Uh, so basically the customers here for an app like this is bored people on the internet. The problem they're having is they're just trying not to be bored. Um, so the requirements here are pretty like low. They're, they're not very, very strict or anything. Uh, the P0 for this is it just needs to work. Like when the person comes and uses it, it needs to feel like it's actually working. Um, it needs to be super low barrier to entry. It doesn't need to be complicated, no signups, no nothing. Um, just needs to kind of work. Uh, the things that people often think about software, like correctness, consistency, um, often don't matter in a lot of scenarios. And in this one in particular, like, does it need to be super correct? Not really. Um, does it need to be really consistent? So everyone's seeing the same number? Not really. We can lose some, some counts and stuff here and there. Um, and so that's basically the problem to be solved. So the workflows that we need to actually do this um, are pretty simple. So we really only need two things. The first is actually pushing the button, um, which will somehow like log that button push from the front end um, and then kind of persist that somewhere so we can grab it later. And then we just need to read the, the pushes um, on the other side. So we just need to get whatever the latest count is and then we just need to return that to the front end. So understanding that this is the only things we need to solve, uh, it's pretty easy to see how this turns into an architecture. Uh, we definitely need a front end for the user to use. And then we need some sort of persistence or database to actually store this count um, for later retrieval. So now let's go into like the system architecture and all the technologies um, that I used to actually build a real world app here. Uh, so the basic architecture is just, you know, the front end so that the user can actually use it. Um, then the other thing that we saw was the persistence so we can actually store this counter. Um, and here I also have a back end. Some people like to do the front end back end together. I don't like to do it. Um, I think it's better to just build in the separation early, um, but you know, not a big deal either way. But for this one in particular, um, basically as you know, the video title says, uh, we're using salt kit on the front end. This is the simplest front end uh, technology that I've been able to find so far. Um, the back end is F sharp because this is what I'm trying to actually learn. And then for persistence, I just went with Postgres. Um, I think SQL handles most business domains well and better than uh, schemaless versions. And Postgres is basically the best SQL database out there that is also open source. So this is the stack. Now, lurking in um, r slash F sharp uh, and F sharp communities, I think a lot of people who are getting started uh, with this technology have a lot of problems figuring out like how to get started. Like what technologies do you need to actually build a, you know, real world app? And so 
Um, here, I just wanted to dive into a bit of the, the technologies I chose and why, because I think that'll help most people just get started. So language, obviously, F-sharp, um, which is why we're kind of doing this. Uh, and then you need like a web server or something to actually run this F-sharp. Uh, it's not really useful just, just by itself. Um, and so for this, I chose Giraffe on ASP.NET. ASP.NET is Microsoft's like official um, web serving you know, technology on .NET. And what Giraffe is doing is basically providing um, a nice API, nice bindings uh, to use it from a functional um, style. So all of .NET is basically geared towards C-sharp, which is object-oriented and kind of you know, bridging that gap between functional and, and, and object oriented can be a little bit um, difficult, but with Giraffe, it makes it super easy to do this. So I would highly recommend Giraffe or, or one of the other F sharp, you know, official um, web servers here. For data layer, um, you could just write raw SQL or whatever access language, you know, your, your persistence has, um, but it's 2022 and there's no reason to do that. Um, a lot of people might reach for uh, Entity Framework. That's kind of like Microsoft's official uh, solution to this, but I find any framework has a little bit too much magic. And again, it's like more object oriented um, and doing that from a functional side, kind of you lose some of the benefits. Um, so for this, I chose uh, Dapper, which is also built for, uh, you know, mainly for C sharp, um, but we can access it in F sharp, but it's so simple um, to use and really has no magic that it's actually not bad to use from F sharp at all. Um, there's also some bindings here, but I found just using Dapper directly is better. Um, and the next one is dbup, which is, again is built mostly for C-sharp, but uh, basically what this does, it just takes uh, SQL scripts and runs them if they haven't been run before, and that's the easiest, uh, least amount of magic migrations um, technology I found. Uh, finally, for testing, um, XUnit, this is the official, basically, .NET solution to this, so definitely stick with that. Um, and then we can get these, these F-sharp functional bind bindings with FSUnit, so I so would also recommend that. Um, so yeah, that's, I think with these technologies, it's, it's pretty easy to set up a, a decent server here and the docs are really good. Um, so, so that's all I need to say on this. So how do I actually host this? Um, so once you have like a working server in each of them, um, basically I decided to host them all in Docker containers. I think that's way cleaner. I can host it anywhere basically. Um, all, all major clouds or even if I'm going bare metal uh, can support Docker containers. Um, so that's why I went, I went with. Um, and then for the actual cloud host uh, specifically, I went with Google Cloud, um, but I think any of the major cloud players would have been fine. I'm just more familiar with them. Um, and so I used Cloud Run to actually host my containers and then Cloud SQL to create a managed version of my database because uh, it's 2022 and I don't wanna have to deal with, you know, uh, maintaining and upgrading my database. Okay, now if you've been watching the channel for a while, um, you probably recognize this architecture already, and that's because this is basically the project boilerplate I use for everything just now with F-sharp. So um, like I was telling you, I like to containerize everything with Docker uh, so that it's really easy to run anywhere, whether it's local or in the cloud somewhere. For front end, I use SvelteKit because it's the easiest you know, front end technology I found. Um, for back end, I'm now using F sharp from C sharp because I really like the functional uh, style and the language is great and .NET is also great. So keeping all those together makes sense. And then finally, just have Postgres here by default, but really easy to switch out other SQL like MySQL or something if, if you wanted. Uh, so if you want to get your hands on this boilerplate, check out cloudc.xyz and you can get the full source code and basically everything I started with to, to build this project. So that's it for building like a very basic web server. Um, all the docs for the technologies and stuff are really easy to follow. So I don't feel like it makes much more sense to go deeper in there. But if you do have questions about like, I don't know, setting up a draft server or something, um, let me know and I can I can talk more about it. Um, but I thought what was more interesting for us to go into is some of the like scalability problems um, that come with building a, a site like this and how I kind of uh, solve some of them more functionally um, because this is a problem all sites have, but doing an object oriented, I think is how most, most people uh, kind of approach this stuff. So the first thing I wanna, I wanna address is that like, scale is probably not a problem. It's probably not a problem for your project, not a problem for like any of my projects. Um, so building a clicker website is probably not gonna get that much traffic. So even thinking about these scale things violates like a lot of rules, uh, whether it's like keep it simple, stupid, or you aren't gonna need it, um, probably a bunch of others. Um, that said, remember that the original, you know, reason that I built this project was actually just learn F sharp, um, learn functional programming. And so uh, I think solving these kinds of problems when you don't actually need it yet, but you know it's a common problem, uh, can be really helpful for when you actually need to, to know it.
And I think I was right. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these efficiency things like caches and queues and stuff um, are often built uh, from an object-oriented perspective. So using it from a functional perspective um, was definitely new to me. Uh, and I, th I think I learned a lot. Um, so when you think about this workflow, this site that I'm building, um, I'm basically asking people to go to a site and spam me, right? Like I want you to click this button a lot and I'm gonna like provide a, a counter that's like consistent and and that's basically like the definition of, of distributed load and, and, and spam. Um, so there's two obvious like bottlenecks that we have in the system. And the first is like in the right section, because you're clicking this and I'm telling you that I'm gonna save it. Um, how do we deal with like a bunch of concurrent clients at the same time? How do we make sure that, um, you know, we're doing atomic updates, we're not like accidentally overriding some updates. Um, and how are we dealing with all this load to our persistence layer? Um, because we're opening up a lot of IO connections um, and that's, that's expensive. On the flip side is the reads, which basically has the same exact number of problems where we want to get the updated version so that you know that like you're clicking, that your things are being saved. Um, and how do we make sure that we're getting the correct number out? Um, how are we kind of protecting that, that IO section? And so I'm going to go over this um, real quickly from a high level. I think it's probably too much to go into this video uh, since we're already going a little bit long. Um, but if you want the full code, I do have it on my website here, um, built all in F-sharp and, and functionally. So, so check that out if you want to see the actual code for this. Um, but basically the way I solved it here is um, kind of a two-pronged approach. So on the front end, um, this is like where all of our load actually happens, right? Like we don't have any API or anything like that. We don't have any cron jobs. So all of the interactions start at the front end. So by actually just making the front end do less work, we're, we're making the whole system do less work. And so for the right section, when you're clicking, basically what I decided to do was to just bash the clicks in the browser. Um, this is super fast. Uh, we're basically just counting however many times you clicked locally. And then I basically just have an interval um, currently set to two seconds that will just send any uh, clicks that I haven't saved already uh, up to the server. Um, so this works because we're basically making the, the front end, again, the source of all these interactions do less. And that means the entire system needs to do less. Now that's good for like single clients, um, but when you have a lot of clients, which again, we probably won't have, um, it's possible that all of them are sending these uh, kind of messages to the server at the same time, which can still add up and you're still kind of opening up these IOs for each one of these requests. And so what I decided to do with here is basically batch these updates. Um, and so what I'm using is F Sharps has a built-in uh, mailbox processor, which is basically their version of like an agent. Um, and this kind of takes the, place of like a singleton, I guess, and, and like a lot of OO. Um, and basically what I built here is basically a queue um, that on flush just compacts all of the updates in the queue into a single operation. Um, and what this allows us to do is basically cut however many operations we have um, over the size of the batch, which really helps even if we have a lot of clients. Now, the trade-off of all of these batching and stuff is, of course, latency. But as we talked about, like, it doesn't need to be that fast. Like, it's just a, a number. Um, and so that's a really easy trade-off to make here. And so that takes care of the read side. Um, again, if you want that code, uh, code link's at the bottom. But now what do we do for the read side? Um, so again, we talked about, like, having the exact right number at the exact right time doesn't really matter. Um, but we do want you to see that, like, if the number is going up, like you see that it's going up, right? Because that actually makes it seem like this thing's being used, that the counter is like, you know, globally distributed, things like that. Um, so for this, basically, we just only read on a cadence and we set the cadence to pretty high. So once every five seconds is pretty good. That's really low QPS ad per client. Um, and we can always configure this if we decide that this is too much load. But then again, we still have this problem of like, well, what if we have a lot of clients and they're all reading on the same at the same time? Um, well, we can kind of solve this by just caching, right? This is like the perfect example of why you need a cache. Um, I thought the problem of, of building a cache uh, in F Sharp on .NET um, collections was pretty interesting, um, but you can find the code in, in the website again uh, for the full source code. And basically that's how I built a full stack web app with, you know, Svelte Kit and F Sharp. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, uh, particularly around Svelte Kit, F Sharp, .NET, um, building kind of like real web apps or anything like that. I'm probably gonna be building a lot more in the coming weeks. So uh, excited to dive into those. Um, but yeah, whatever you're interested in, that's that's probably what I'll go and make. So, so let me know. Final ask is to just go to smash the button and click the button a lot. Um, 
it'd be great if you all could break it and then that would help me know that it doesn't scale enough. And then finally, if you just wanna get started with F Sharp and Docker containers, um, go check out this video here. I've got the link here and I'll have the link in the description. Um, that should get you started with, with part of the Cloud Seed uh, Project Boilerplate. So I think that's it. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.